Again, my name is Russell Graves. If you haven't joined in here before, uh, I see a lot of names on the list today of, of people who have been on trips with me before, as well as some names I recognize just from being in some of the uh, the webinars that I do. But I do recognize a few names I haven't seen before. So if this is your first time here. Welcome, everybody, and uh, hope you find some, something useful in this webinar I'll be presenting today. And the title of the webinar is like you like you see there, Shooting Wildlife Photos That Win Contests. And... Uh, as always, as I go through the presentation today, I, I want to make this as much of a dialogue as we can and not necessarily a monologue. So if you have any questions as we go through the uh, slides today, feel free to pop those in. Questions can be about shooting photos for contests. It can be about how I took a particular picture because one of the things that I do whenever I, I do these webinars is always make sure I put plenty of pictures in there because that's what we're here to talk about are pictures anyway and photography. So I put plenty of my own pictures in there. So if you want to uh, have an idea of what it took to make some of these pictures that you see today, or again, you have some specific questions in regards to the, to the various topics I'll talk about today, or if you just have any uh, camera questions in general, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to answer those. So as you think about those questions, again, pop them in there. I'll answer them as I see them on my screen. And, uh, and, We'll, we'll make a good presentation out of it. Again, shooting wildlife photos that win contests. My name is Russell Graves. I'm coming to you live right now from Dodge City, Texas, from the world headquarters of RussellGraves.com. Uh, I live out in the country on a little farm. And so I'm, I'm coming to you live by the miracle of the internet. So as we get started, let's talk about this. And with, with a full disclosure, let me say this. I have never entered a contest before in my life and you may be thinking well how can he talk about shooting photos that win contest and he's never entered a contest before i've never entered them before but the contest i enter a little bit different i make my living as a professional photographer so what i do is i shoot for a lot of different magazines and so just the competitiveness of getting your pictures in magazines or getting selected by a commercial client to shoot uh pictures that they're going to use for advertisements or shoot pictures that uh that are going to appear in the pages of a magazine or on the cover of a magazine. Those are my competitions, but organized competitions. I've never really entered those before, but I have judged a lot of them. And in fact, uh, this past summer, I just wrapped up within the past month. I think I wrapped up judging two different contests. One contest uh, was the, uh, the photography contest that that's held by the American agriculture editors association. And uh, they have a members only contest. So I've been judging that contest for the past few years. And then another contest was just a nature photography contest. And I can't divulge the name of that contest because they have not announced the winners yet. And they ask us to not reveal that we judge that contest. So I'm going to hold them to that. But it's a suffice it to say it's a big contest. Uh, and uh, it's it's has a lot of notoriety to it. So, but again, I can't tell you which one that is. So I've judged a lot of contests. I looked at literally tens of thousands of images of other people. So the perspective I'm going to bring you today is not necessarily someone who enters contests to try to win them, but someone who's actually judged a lot of them and get to pick the winners and ultimately losers of, of these various contests. So these are some of the perspectives I'm going to bring you from a judge's standpoint and uh, what I think would if I could have this conversation with everybody that enters contests, it would raise the quality of the contest a little more and plus uh, save some headache in the end. Now, I have do have a question that came up already. Uh, Bernice asked, do most contests require the photographer to waive copyright in their photos or have the contest become the owner of the photo? Uh, I'll, I'm will i going to get into a little bit of that here in a minute, Bernice, so if you'll be patient with me. That's actually one of the, one of the topics I, or one of the uh, things I was going to bring up later on this presentation. Now, let me say this, even though I haven't ever entered a contest, I have coached somebody to be really successful in contest before. And that's this guy right here. This is my son. Uh, he just turned 17. His name is Ryan. If, if I don't, I don't see if anybody here was on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, July bears trip, the Alaska uncharted bears trip, but he actually came along with me to help out on that trip to help just, move gear around, set up tents, do whatever we needed him to do. But he was in the field with us for a couple of weeks. And uh, his nickname is Old Son. That's what we called him. But anyway, he's uh, he's been pretty successful in photography contests himself. He He's won the State 4-H contest uh, uh, 
on, a, on numerous occasions, won the various categories on numerous occasions. He's done well at our county fair. He, he's done generally well in, uh, in regards to uh, every contest he's ever entered. So all the tips I'm going to give you today are the tips that I give him that he's learned as he's grown up. Now, let me just say this. Everything I'm going to talk today, there's no magic bullet. There's no silver bullet in here that's going to just set off a, a, a an epiphany, a light bulb over your head and have an epiphany where that's the one thing you need to do. Really, a lot of these things are kind of common sense. And as such, I found that, that people, they may do one or two of these things when they're in these contests, but if you kind of take, take all of these in totality and use this as kind of a checklist to make sure you've done all these things, your, your chances of, of placing better in contests will go way, way up. And the first one is, this goes to what Bernice was saying, is review the rules. And that's, you know, one of the things that we, as I judge contest, and most of the time it's with a panel of judges, I'm not the only one, uh, that you have to end up kicking at least a certain number of pictures out, maybe even 10% of the pictures out of the particular, out of the contest is people just fail to re read the rules. And, uh, and reviewing the rules is the utmost importance. You know, it's going to make sure you get in the correct categories. Uh, I've saw pictures on the contest I judged recently where the, the pictures they entered were, were were not bad pictures, but they just didn't fit the contest. So someone, whoever entered those, just didn't read the rules to the contest. And so, and as part of the rules, Bernice, one of the things you want to do is make sure that uh, that it's not a copyright grab for the uh, for the contest. Now I could go. I could talk a whole webinar on copyright law. I'm not a lawyer, but I do know a little bit about it. And one of the things that bothers me about some contests, and they will do that, is they uh, they require you to give up your copyright. And really, what they're trying to do is gather up a bunch of nice pictures to use for their own marketing, so they don't have to pay for it. And so, essentially, what you're doing is, if there's any kind of entry fee, you're having to pay to enter your picture. And if that picture wins, Oh, by the way, they're, they're, they've just got the right to use that however they want to use it and to monetize it however they want to use it in the future. I have read rules and contests that do do that. There are a lot of contests that have uh, learned not to prey on unsuspecting photographers like that. And so they don't have that regulation in there. But again, it depends on the contest. And I would, uh, I would recommend that you just review the rules thoroughly before you even enter the contest. And again, the whole copyright thing is uh, I'm not a copyright attorney. There's some ins and outs that that I probably don't understand, but I've been doing the I've been in the business and been dealing with copyright since uh, 1989, I guess, was the first time I ever heard had pictures published in a magazine. So it's something, again, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with. But uh, again, make sure you re review the rules and that rules not only involves the copyright, but it also involves the various categories within that contest or the format by which they need the, the, the images. So in other words, if they say they, don't, they only need JPEG images, 2000 pixels wide at the widest, don't give them anything smaller, don't give them anything bigger, give them exactly what they're looking for. And that's another thing that people, uh, that, that people that we've had to kick pictures out of contests for because there's oftentimes a limit on how much it's cropped or there, there's a limit on how it's cropped or there's a limit on the image size that they turn in. And if they don't follow those rules to the T, uh, by virtue of the rules, the, those pictures have to be removed and removed from consideration beyond that point. So again, review the rules. That that That's one of those things that's common sense, but uh, we see people who just don't do it. And again, in between time, I'm just going to show you some pictures that I like that I took that uh, if I were going to enter a contest, these would be some of the pictures that I would enter. And as we go through these, you're going to see a common theme as I sort of get to the towards the, the back end of this presentation when I with some more of my tips. Another thing I think you do is you shoot for the contest. Uh, you, you know, it's it's easy to think about going through your archive of images and picking out pictures that may work for the contest. But, you know, if, if it's a. If it's and I. I'm going to, I'm going to say some names here you don't know about, and they may not have a contest, but I'm just spitballing and coming up with some names. But for example, if the Audubon uh, Society has a contest and it would do you as a photographer well to understand what the Audubon is all about, what their mission is, and it would do you well to, to shoot for that contest. You know, again, once you've re re reviewed the rules and you've looked at some past images in the contest, shoot for the contest and you know because they're they're looking to 
uh, they're looking to go. I mean, they're looking to with their contest. They're looking to promote a certain conservation ethic. They're looking to, to su support a certain point of view. And so, if you can shoot Im images specifically for whatever that organization is or whatever that contest is, one of the in Texas, I'm trying to one of the contests that that uh, a couple of contests I can think of that is held is Texas Parks and Wildlife Department holds an annual photography contest and they're wanting to celebrate Texas wildlife and Texas parks and public lands. And so when I say shoot for the contest, if I was going to go shoot for that, I would want to try to design pictures and think of pictures that would fit their ultimate mission of what they're trying to promote. Uh, the Texas Association of Electrical Cooperatives, they also have a photo contest as well. And their mission is to, to, to promote uh, rural lifestyles and rural livings and the in the in those pictures that kind of match who their constituency is and so uh, again shoot for the contest and gene asked what's your lens of choice uh gene i'll you know that'll that'll i'll tell you what my lens of choice is in just a second but that also segues ways into uh, a webinar i'm doing in a, in a few weeks i can't remember the exact date but in a few weeks be looking for a uh a webinar called using metadata to improve your photography. And that's kind of all about that stuff. But uh, my lens of choice, if it depends on what I'm shooting, you know, I can look at the data of my, I can look at my metadata and tell you that my lenses are biased. Uh, they're, they're equally distributed. I use all of my lenses an equal amount, but for all these wildlife pictures you're looking at, they were all shot with the 500 millimeter lens for the most part, except the, the Eagle. The eagle was shot with a 200 millimeter lens. I actually shot that picture just a couple of weeks ago. And that was taken with the iPhone, the picture of my son. Great question so far. And I mentioned this briefly before. Uh, I think it's important too to review the past winners. And really uh, decide if you know what what it's took to win the contest in the past. You know, one of the uh, when I used to be a high school teacher and we competed in a lot of different academic contests. One of the things I would do continually is look at who the winners were in the other various contests, and I would look at the scores of those winners so I could understand what it would take to win. Because every now and then we knew that once we saw who the competition was. We realize that, you know, there's nothing I can do to win that contest. So is it even worth entering? And I think that's an honest conversation you need to have it with yourself at some point. Uh, you know, and I, and I don't say that looking down on anybody because I look at some of the contests like uh, the Audubon contest and and uh, and uh, what's the one they make a big they make a big book about it. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, I think it's like some kind of British society. It's nature photographer of the year. And I look at some of the pictures in those books and, and then I realize that, you know, uh, I, I might not could win some of those contests. And so I think it's it's helpful to review the past past winners to see if it's something you can even compete in. Number one. Number two, I think it's helpful just to see what's been picked and, you know, and, and kind of line up what the aesthetic of that contest has been in the past and then try to decide, you know, how do I take my pictures that closely line up with the aesthetic? Because. Believe it or not, over time you start seeing patterns and you start seeing uh, the, the the same types of pictures may win a different contest over and over and over again. Well, not, not the same picture, but the same types of pictures. Uh, the contest I just judged, once you take a look at, if I could reveal who, what, the, what the contest is, or if you go back and look at the past winners of those contests, You'll see kind of a, a theme that, that the same types of pictures win each time. And those types of pictures are something that's, uh, you know, a little unusual like this one here of this frog that's silhouetted on the backside of this uh, switchgrass leaf. This tree frog that's silhouetted on the backside of the switchgrass leaf and has all the elements that, that you want in an intriguing wildlife photograph. It's got an out-of-focus background. It's got showing a little bit of behavior. It's showing... Uh, a little bit of interest. It's one of those pictures that stops and and makes you look a little closer. And really, that that's the thing. That's the key to to uh, shooting some of these shooting for some of these contests. And I'll get into that a little bit in a minute. But you've got a you've got a real short amount of time to make a good first impression. 
This is one of my favorite shots I've taken before. Uh, I call this the raccoon family portrait. This was, this was when I used to live in Northwest Texas up until I moved a couple of years ago. We live on acreage there out in the country. And I, uh, we had a little, a veritable wildlife highway just right 50 yards behind the house. And so I'd set up camera traps. And then that's one night I took the picture of those two raccoons uh, cruising past the camera trap. And you can see the one he actually spotted the, the camera and was looking at it. So uh, I love that shot. But well, I'll go ahead and talk about this. When you when you look when you're thinking about photos on this last contest, I judged this nature photography contest. The first batch of images I got, we did the first batch remotely where they sent us all the pictures to look at. And I literally had four or 5,000 pictures I had to go through. And so as I'm going through the pictures, I'm making a snap second decision on whether or not that picture is worthy or not. And I say worthy, they're all worthy. I don't mean it that way, but worthy to advance to the next round. And so really what I'm looking for is something that's going to catch my eye right off the bat. And it may be complementary colors. It may be a dynamic behavior. It may be something else that's going to catch my eye. And so as you think about contest photography, that's one of the things you need to think about. In other words, a uh, sometimes a well-lit, well-composed picture is not good enough when you've got a thousand other pictures that are the same, you know, of the same quality. You, they're all at that point when you enter some of these contests, all the pictures are going to be good. So what can you do to make your pictures sort of stand out and uh and just get the attention a judge like me again i'm going through a ton of pictures and so as i'm going through these pictures and maybe the first round spending a second or two on each picture looking at it real quick i'm just trying to make a snap judgment to try to get to the next picture so i can go through the the, the backlog of work that's required to go from the round one of the judging and then inev inevitably get to round two round three and beyond and so as such, as I'm going through these pictures, one of the first things I'm looking for, and it's the same way I judge my own pictures. When I get home from a, a trip and I am, uh, and I'm putting my pictures into my own personal contest, and that contest is what's going to get shown to other people, what's going to go to clients, what's going to go on my website. Uh, one of the first things I look at is technical excellence. I mean, it's got to be uh, less than technically perfect pictures typically won't won't work. And so one of the first things I think about is, is the picture sharp? Uh, you'd be surprised that when we judge some of these pictures with all this technology we have, how many pictures that I ultimately look at that just aren't sharp. We talked about 10% of the pictures get classed out because of the rules, maybe another 10% get classed out because they're just not sharp. And uh, that's one of the key things I start looking for because, you know, you get to a point, these cameras are such uh, remarkable pieces of technology that a lot of people can take. A picture in good light like of this bob white quail uh and a lot of people can you know compose them well like is in this picture and a lot of people can check all the boxes but the the one thing that really is going to separate a winner from a loser ultimately is when when you get down to that last round and there's you're looking at these pictures like on this last con i keep referring to this last contest i judged we're in a room and we're looking at these pictures uh, on an 80 inch screen on, on the wall. And I mean, we're doing everything, trying to figure out when you're deciding who's going to win, we're walking up to the screen and looking at it as critically as we can to see which picture is sharp. And if it's not as sharp as another one, then it gets kicked, kicked aside. So technical excellence is another, is, a, is something that sometimes gets overlooked, but it's, it's something that gets looked at. Ruben, it just asked the question, do you use flash during the daytime and what type of flash do you use? I don't typically use flash during the daytime, Ruben. I'm not a huge fan of flash in the daytime. Uh, on this particular shot here, that was actually set up because I wanted to, I wanted it to, uh, to look like a studio shot when I took the picture. And so I was using, uh, one flash off camera to the left, again, kind of a one light setup. And the flash I was using was the Canon, I think it's a 580 EX2 flash. And so I've got a wireless flash controller that I can put inside my camera housing on my camera trap. And then I can, usually what I'll do is just put the flash inside of a Ziploc bag to weather seal it and then strap it to a tree. And animals usually don't, they pay attention to it as you can see, but it usually doesn't bother them too much. So uh, when I use the flash outdoors, like in this instance, I usually just use the the 
hot shoe mounted flashes, but I'll, I'll use the flash controllers and move them off the off the camera to take the picture. And another thing of, about being sharp is a lack of motion blur, unless that's what you're trying to do on purpose. You know, uh, it's 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 sometimes and again, this gets to being this picky. If you've got two pictures and one picture is perfectly sharp and everything's sharp about it, and the other ones maybe the ears are blurred a little bit or the feet are blurred a little bit, uh, sometimes that'll take away from the uh, the effect. Unless it's done on purpose, and uh, you can typically see when something like motion blur is done on purpose or when it's not done on purpose. That picture there was taken in the uh, Great Smoky Mountains. This is a whitetail buck in, in the rut, and he's actually what he's doing there is if you've never seen deer do this before, they'll, when they're making a scrape, they'll scrape, they'll scrape all the vegetation and leaves off the ground and then they'll urinate in it. And it creates like a scent marker for the does who are in heat. They know where the bucks are hanging around at. And so as part of that process, deer have glands around their eyes on top of their head and in their mouth, scent glands, and they'll create a licking branch ab above the scrape that they're making. And that's what he's doing there is, uh, He's just in the first few steps of making a scrape. And so he is uh, creating his licking branch right there. And then the next, next piece of advice I can give you is enter lots of categories. If there's a lot of cat categories in the contest, I think you just kind of play the shotgun approach. You enter as many categories as you can and just uh, play your odds. You know, if it's kind of like, it's kind of like playing a slot machine, uh, if you put in one quarter, your odds of winning are, are at one degree. If you end up putting in a lot of quarters, you increase your odds of winning a little bit. And so that's what I'm thinking about on the on the photo contest is there are lots of categories. These past couple of uh, contests that I judged, it kind of surprised me that you'd see a photographer that had good pictures, but then they wouldn't, uh, they'd only enter one or two categories. And so my thought is that if, uh, if I'm going to enter, I'm going to enter as many categories as I can just to improve my chances of winning. Because when you enter these contests, there's one thing you don't know. Or I think, or I, I suspect you don't know. I know in the contest I've judged that if, if let's say I'll pick a name off the list. Let's say if Gene was to enter uh, pictures in five or six categories, Gene doesn't get to see the other pictures are in it. All he knows is what he's entered. And so the reason why you enter a lot of categories is because you know, if you're entering a Texas wildlife photography contest, undoubtedly you'd have a lot of pictures of white-tailed deer. But if you're if there's a category on, say, reptiles, there may not be very many horn toads in the pic in the in the uh, in the uh, in the in, in the lot. So, since you don't know how many pictures necessarily are entered in each category, you're, you're trying to spread out your odds of winning over time over over a bunch of different categories, and so. Enter lots of categories uh, and it'll increase your odds of winning. I had a few questions just roll in. Sue asked, Alaska Magazine has a yearly photo contest for images taken only in Alaska. Thought some of your clients that have been on your trips may be interested and I believe there's no submission fee. Okay, well, that's a good, that's a good uh, tip, Sue. I appreciate that. Yeah, so what Sue's saying is Alaska Magazine has a contest that you can uh, enter. And so, yeah, we, we definitely take a lot of people to Alaska and get lots of great pictures up there. And then Carrie asked, Hey, Carrie, I hope you're doing well. Uh, he asked how motion blur, how can you avoid this when subjects are in motion? I have some with deer running and got some blur shutter speed. It was at one four thousandth of a second. You know, sometimes it's a little bit hard. Usually what I do is, uh, I'll try my best to pan. And that way, if it's a little, if the backgrounds are a little bit blurry, then you, it at least looks like it's part of the technique that you're trying to do. And I guess what I'm talking about on, on the motion blur earlier was not necessarily the animal moving so much. I need to clarify, not so much the animal moving so much, but a, a, a something that would show maybe poor technique on your part, you know, where you're not trying to create a motion blur or you're not, or you're just not using a tripod or something else to steady your camera. Uh, and, and that motion blur that you're creating ends up showing up in the picture. Lots of good questions coming in today, by the way. I appreciate those. One of the coolest, I'll talk about these a little bit. One of the coolest birds I think I've ever seen are the lesser prairie chickens. And they live in a 
pocket of habitat in the Texas Panhandle, eastern New Mexico, Oklahoma, Colorado, and a little bit of Kansas, kind of the southern high plains area. And every year they do this the mating dance in April. They go back to the same place every year to to do it. It's called a lek. And so the it's kind of like the salmon swimming back to where they were born to lay their eggs. Well, these these prairie chickens will fly back to these same leks every year and do their mating dance. And just to be on a lek in the morning when the sun comes up and these guys are out doing their thing, it's pretty extraordinary. And then, of course, that's a sandhill crane uh, in the upper left. And then a coyote, one of my favorite animals in the lower right. Ruben asked, do you use Topaz AI denoise? And are these softwares, are these types of software permitted in, in contests? Uh, I don't use any of those, Ruben. Really, I, I, I work really, really, really hard at trying to uh, uh, use good fundamental techniques on taking pictures and, you know, sh and doing that. I use a tripod religiously. I shoot at low ISOs and I try to uh, just understand really the animals and how to get close to the animals. And so that way I can optimize the chances of, of getting good pictures. So I don't use those. Uh, I don't use any of those various uh, software programs. And then also, are they permitted in, in contests? You've got to read the rules on those because I'm sure different contests say different things. Uh, the contest that I just finished judging a couple of weeks ago. Well, actually, I finished the final judging last weekend. Uh, they did not, they did not allow any kind of, uh, post-processing. In fact, we, we had to look at just a first generation JPEG and in what, in other words, they took the raw files and made a JPEG from it. They allowed a little bit of color correction, a little bit of cropping, but not much beyond that. They just wanted to see what people are capable of doing without all the technology behind it. Uh. Craig says in a generic wildlife photo contest, all things do being equal. Do you as a judge pay more attention to the more exotic animals? Uh, is an image of a tiger in Africa more appealing than a coyote in the California desert? You know, really, that's a good question, Craig. It, it, there's a couple things there and I'm going to try to unpack. One, it really depends on the category. You know, in some of the contests I've judged, those nest two wouldn't necessarily go in the same category together. But assuming they did go in the category together, you know, I the the exoticness of the animal. I'll pay attention. Maybe I may pay attention to it the first time, uh, but ultimately, if it's going to win or not, I, I don't really pay much attention to that because then it comes down to a lot of the technical details and a lot of just the, how dynamic the photo it is. And again, when I say words like dynamic, that's something that's hard to quantify. I mean, it's sort of it's an it's it's an opinion, and so you know, based on the uh, and that's what judges do based on the rules of the contest. They're asked to give their expertise and opinion on whether or not they, which pictures they think are the best. And so once you can rule pictures out of whether or not they follow the rules, whether or not they're technically excellent, then it just kind of comes down to, you know, the, the look of the picture. And again, how using that word dynamic, how dynamic I think that the pictures ends up being. So, yeah, I wouldn't, a tiger in Africa would not sway me more than a coyote in the California desert. Actually, I might be swayed the other way around because I'm a, although Africa's cool, I'm really a fan of native wildlife. And so native American wildlife. And so, uh, I, you know, I might be more biased towards a coyote in the California desert if it's a super fantastic picture. And that's why I love, you know, I mentioned before, I'm, I think I've had two or three coyotes in this presentation already because I really like coyotes. Uh, Daniel asked the question, if we do not have a Canon 500 millimeter lens, we use a Canon 300 L with a 1.4 teleconverter. Absolutely. I've got that same lens and it's a super sharp lens. And, uh, and I've used that combination a lot of times, Daniel, the, when I think one of the things that served me well is when I first started taking pictures back when I was a teenager and then into my twenties. I didn't have the money to go out and buy a big lens. I just didn't have it. So the wildlife lens I used forever, and this is no joke, was a 70 to 200 millimeter F 2.8 lens. I didn't even have a teleconverter. And so shooting pictures of things like deer and coyotes with the 200 millimeter lens is super difficult. But one thing it made me better at was just understanding how to get close to animals. Now, 
using those same techniques of being able to read animals and getting close to them. Now that I use a 500 millimeter lens, my job gets easier, but I still use those same techniques I learned a long time ago. So you don't have to use the biggest lenses available uh, to shoot pictures. In fact, you get to a point, I think there's a point of diminishing returns that you can get lenses so big that you for, you, you, you forget that there's a technique and it's a, it's a, it's, to me, it's a photography fundamental technique of getting as close as you can to the subject. And at some point you shoot through so much air and if the air is dirty, the images won't end up being sharp. And so I'm an advocate of one, it, you know, those 800, like Canon makes an 800 millimeter lens, which are great. You know, theoretically you could put a two, a two X converter on it, make it 1600 millimeters and with a crop body, get up to 2000 millimeters. Now, that all sounds good on paper, but when you get to the reality of shooting in the field and you're having to shoot through so much air that's dirty with, with heat bubbles bubbling up off the ground or just the, just the particulates that, that are in the air on, at any given time, it's going to inherently make your, lens, make your pictures softer. And so I'm an advocate of, of the closer you can get, the better. And if I felt like I could do a good job with a 300 millimeter lens, Daniel, I'd use a... Uh, a 300 millimeter lens and but instead my compromise that's kind of the sweet spot for me is that 500 millimeter lens and linda asked what zoom lens do you use i the 500 lens i use now is just a prime a straight 500 the only zoom lens i use is a 70 to 200 millimeter and then uh can you use a converter on the one to 400 if it's the canon yeah i've seen a lot of people use the the 1.4 converter on that one to 400 with good results And this is another thing that gets my eye on, no matter if it's an agriculture photography contest or whether it's a wildlife and nature photography contest, the one thing that really catches my eye early on is, is use of dramatic lighting. And that, that may be the one thing that's hardest to find the intersection on because you've got to rely on the animals being active at the time of day you're trying to photograph it. And then you've got to position yourself in the right place at the right time and hopefully those animals come along where you can shoot pictures of animals in dramatic lighting. And for me, dramatic lighting is a low angle of light. First, first half hour of the day, last half hour of the day could be some, uh, it may not be right in, the, in at that early, but it's got to have some dramatic clouds or something in it. And it's uh, most likely not going to be front lighting. Like in this example of the raccoon, uh, it's, it's more side lighting, but that dramatic lighting where you can get that detail and shadows and light areas uh, really, really does make a difference. And it helps catch a judge's eye early on that when he's just sitting there looking through pictures, he or she is looking through pictures, trying to decide what makes the first cut. Uh, dramatic lighting will, will definitely help your picture stand out. And to tell you the story of this raccoon, we were, uh, we were on a, a Florida Everglades trip back in last February. And one of the things we do on that trip is take a boat out into the swamp, out into the, not the swamps, but the, uh, uh, area, the brackish waters in an area of the Everglades called 10,000 islands. And so in what 10,000 islands are is a bunch of mangrove islands that grow on oyster reefs, uh, out at the edge of the Gulf of Florida, where the Gulf of Florida and all these freshwater rivers kind of run together and meet. And we, took the boat out by this one island that the guy who was driving the boat said he had been seeing a lot of uh, raccoons on. And these raccoons are a, are a, a subspecies of raccoons. They're the, you know, essentially the same raccoons as ev almost everyone has in their backyards. But these only live on those little bitty islands and they only drink water when it, when it rains because they're surrounded. And these islands are little bitty. Uh, and, and they spend their days eating, uh, foraging around in the, in the oyster beds, looking for little crabs, little worms, anything else they can find. And you can see how this one here, his nose is all skin up from foraging around those, those rocks and stuff every single day. And when we saw this raccoon, we floated up to it. And he was pretty interested in it, in us. And uh, in fact, he tried to swim out to the boat and I like he wanted to get in the boat with us, but he was, he was uh, super friendly. I mean, we didn't pet him or anything, but super friendly, wasn't afraid of us. And, and that's one of those magical moments that makes wildlife photography so cool. In fact, we were so close. I shot that picture with a, with a 200 millimeter lens because we actually got too close 
to use the big lenses. So we had to switch lenses in midstream. We were so close to that raccoon. And that's an example of a picture with dramatic lighting that was shot uh, as a silhouette of an elk in Montana. That picture was actually shot later in the morning, but the it being cloudy all morning, the clouds were starting to clear. So you get that really those really dramatic clouds in the background. And then another thing I think really helps stand out is uh, when you think behavior. You know, we were we were looking at a lot of bird pictures uh, in this past contest I did, and beautiful bird pictures overall. And one of the things though that you get kind of jaded to, or you know, are essentially birds on a stick. Uh, and I know birds land on limbs, but when you're talking about how to win a contest. Is it better to have a picture a picture of a static bird on a limb that's, you know, you can have, you can be well composed, uh, well lit. You can have dramatic lighting. You have all those check boxes that we've already talked about. But if it's just a bird sitting there, do you, you know, the question is what wins? Just a bird sitting there or a bird doing something a little bit dynamic? And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is think behavior and always try to get pictures of behavior. Uh, this picture here of this white-tailed buck, I think to me, this is a more interesting photograph than another picture I have where the buck's just looking at the camera. This buck, he's actually, uh, was during the rut and he's actually smelling the wind. And that's a response that ungulates do called the Fleming response. And it's where they can test the wind and, and then close their nostrils up. And and really it's, it's the best analogy I can think of. And it's probably not a proper analogy, but you've seen wine tasters, how they can, sip wine and kind of close up their nose and throat and really capture all the notes of the of the wine flavor and be able to experience those not only in, on their tongue but also in their nose and this is deer can do the same thing they can they can take they can test the wind and be able to discern all the different scents that they can capture off the wind and that's what he's doing there and what he's doing in response to is there's some uh, does nearby and he was trying to figure out if they were uh, ready to breed or not and so again I, one of the things I always try to do is is uh, think behavior and capture pictures of animals doing the things that those animals do, and it's that's a really generic thing, but it really it's going to capture judges' eyes when they're looking at it because if you get everything right technically and it's in good dramatic lighting and it's showing some kind of behavior, those pictures are going to be hard to beat ultimately. And those same things I'm telling you are the same ways that I I judge I I try to coach my son on when we go out and take pictures of stuff and try to help him kind of understand the process of what judges are going to be looking for uh, a picture, right? You know, and, and, and if you put it in the framework of how I do my work and, 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 you know, images that, that are being used for a, a magazine story, even though a magazine may hire me to shoot the pictures exclusively for a story, there's still a competition in there for myself because I end up pay, getting paid more if they use the pictures in a, if they use the pictures in, in either full page, double page, or even on the cover. And so I'm trying to take pictures that convey all the things I've been talking about in a way that, that once they get to the magazine, it's competing for, for page space. And so a picture like this of a turkey calling in great light is going to be in a little bit dramatic is always going to be a picture of a turkey just standing there. So always think behavior when you're taking these pictures. Oh, there's another coyote picture. And this is, I'm going to get on the soapbox a little bit when I say this, you got to remember composition. And that sounds so much like photography 101, but I was shocked when I was judging that photography, that nature photography contest that I just got through judging last weekend, I was shocked when on the first round of pictures, how many pictures that were technically excellent and in dramatic lighting and were showing some kind of good behavior were poorly composed. It, it was just, it amazed me. And I, and I think as I think back of why that is, and it, and, and I would, I'm going to say, I bet I eliminated 20% of the pictures I looked at because of poor composition. And, in other words, uh, you know, they didn't follow the rules of thirds. They didn't follow any of the traditional uh, composition techniques that, that 
we employ. And, you know, sometimes you, you can break the rule of thirds composition. I mean, that's, that's possible, but it's got to look purposeful and it's got to, you know, it's got to really kind of carry the image in a strong sort of way. Uh, but you'd have pictures of, let's say this elk right here, and it would be, you know, the elk may be shoved all the way to the left side of the image and really not have, there's not many things that are dynamic about it at all. And, and again, it's just like people didn't think about composition when they were taking the pictures. And I think the reason for that is, uh, I, I really think it's this, the technology is sort of dumbing people down when it comes to composition, you know, I always jokingly tell people I used to be able to, I used to be able to follow directions. Uh, I used to be able to follow directions until smartphones came out and they'll just tell you which way to go now. And I think the same things happen with cameras because people get so locked into just using their middle focusing point and they just point the camera at the subject and take the picture with no regards to composition overall. And so, uh, you know, again, it, it was it was shocking to me how many places didn't follow the conventional compositional rules. And even so, towards the end of the contest, once we were able to whittle down from the big mass of images to a few more that are, you know, we went from, say, I don't know, there might have been five, let's say 4,000 images in the whole contest was the first round. Second round, we did the uh, the top. probably the top 40 to 50 once the first round was eliminated, the top 40 or 50 in each category. And then the last round we had to pick the, the we had to rank the top six pictures. And more often than not, this is probably the one, if, if they, they weren't technically excellent, they got kicked out. But if they were technically excellent, this was number two. Uh, the, an, the picture could be of the animal doing something really dynamic, but if it wasn't well composed or thoughtfully composed, we, uh, we typically kicked it out. And then another question came in here. S Steve says, what does that mean, composition of whole besides the rule of thirds? Well, I think I'm going to back up through here, Steve, and talk about some of these pictures from a compositional standpoint as I see it. Uh, I, I, I mean, rule of thirds is kind of a basis of where everybody starts on composition. But I think really composition is kind of, as I describe it, is kind of a way that the subject sort of fits into its surroundings. Uh, I'll kind of go back through some of these pictures that I've already shown you. Like, you know, like the bear sitting there. We shot that picture on the Kenai Peninsula trip a couple weeks ago. And just the bear there, this, in my mind, and this is, again, something that's sub subjective, but in my mind, the picture on the left, even though I didn't show you in the proper format, I had to format these images to fit the formats of the of the the constraints of the of the template I used to put this this slide presentation together, but the picture on the left of the bear uh, just looks better as a as a vertical picture. It it when you shoot it as a horizontal, it it almost looks like a square peg in a round hole. The, the bear because the bear is kind of vertically oriented, it doesn't fit. And so uh, this picture from a from an eyeball standpoint, the eyes don't follow the rules of third in the original. If you want to see the original, if you go to just about a week or so ago on the Backcountry Journeys Tribe page, you'll see it there. But that picture looks better as a vertical as opposed to a horizontal. The same way with the picture of the coyote or the prairie chicken there. Uh, they look better as a, as a horizontal as opposed to a vertical. From a compositional standpoint, the picture in the, in the lower right, or both pictures you can see, the subject's kind of shoved off to the right. May not follow exactly the rule of thirds to a T, but it's kind of a general idea of the rule of thirds because the subject is pushed off to the right of the picture and it gives a, a little more space to kind of look into the left. And some of the pictures I was talking about that get kicked out is the coyote maybe jumping into the edge of the frame, which makes it look a little bit awkward. And even that you can see as that elk is bugling, giving it just enough space out in front of it to uh, to look like it's bugling into something, not letting that left edge crowd that elk so much. And same way there, you know, if you if you look at this picture of this bald eagle, 
the eagle's kind of looking down into empty space. There's more space where he's looking into than there is space where he's flying flying from. And so the if we if we look at an unconventional, if we look at splitting this horizontally, this image across the middle uh, the middle diagonal across this. I said horizontally. If we look at splitting this image diagonally, that eagle sits above the diagonal line. And so that way it's given it compositionally, it's, it's kind of balancing it more and giving it more space to fly into. In the same way as some of these, Ruben asked, don't you think showing the entire bird and or, or animal is better composed image than, than those crop photos? Not really. I mean, this picture here to me is a lot more dramatic. Uh, than it than it would be if we showed the entire animal and so uh i think it really depends on this on the on the photo of and and what the animal's doing to make it look better like these prairie dogs cuddling together to me there's you, you know you know there's the rest of the prairie dog there but just a tight shot of being able to see their facial expressions is better as opposed to uh uh being backed off and these pictures by the way aren't aren't they're only cropped just to fit into the to the confound to the com uh to the confines of this slide presentation and so these pictures that you're looking at on this on this slideshow are pretty much uh how they i mean how they came out of the camera from a cropping standpoint like i said they're cropped a little bit just to fit into the placeholders for this template i used to create this slideshow but for the most part they're not cropped I didn't take a picture of that elk and crop it way in just to show its face. That's how it came out of, out of the image. And just like on this picture of the raccoons here, uh, this shot actually, this how it came out of, how it came out of the camera. And so, yeah, I, I think Ruben, it depends on the pictures and on, on, and the animal and, you know, sort of what it's ultimately what it looks like, whether it's cropped or whether it's not cropped like i think this picture of the turkey is better cropped than showing and i've got thousands of pictures of showing the whole body but i think this picture is a better picture because it is cropped because you can actually see the the turkey's facial expressions and uh how serious it's taking this job right there good questions by the way oh yeah so Craig asked, speaking of composition, oh, what I was going to say before that is, by the way, Ruben, thanks for all your questions and thanks everybody else for your questions as well. There are a lot of great questions coming in today. Craig asked, speaking of composition, how do you judge depth of field of a blurred background versus a wildlife image that includes some of the background if it's interesting? Uh, it, you know, really, it's a, again, it's a judgment call on that, Craig. I just kind of look at it uh, like the picture of this coyote howling right here. The background is, in my opinion, the least interesting part of it. And so if if you could see more background, it, I think in my mind, it would actually detract from this image. Now, if we look at the picture in the upper right of the bear, I actually shot that with a 35 millimeter lens. And I, to me, I think when you can include, if you can pull off a picture like that one, of uh, showing the bear kind of in its habitat and where it lives, it, to me, it's it's uh, those are powerful images in themselves. So it doesn't have to be like the picture of the quail on the left with just a out of focus, blurry background. Sometimes, if you can take a picture like the one in the upper right, where you can show some habitat, and you, and again, if you can pull that off, that's that's I, I really like pictures like that. I think that's the last one. Any other questions so far? It's twelve fifty one. Man, that hour flew by quick. All right, I'm going to wait around on questions a little bit because I know there's a little bit of lag time. I'll go ahead and go through a couple more pictures uh, while we're waiting and share with you my contact info. Is you guys, if you think of any more questions, if you if you think of any questions beyond this presentation, be sure to let me know. Uh, sometimes it may be a day or two before I can get back to it, but almost I'll always answer your questions, and so 
you can check out my website if you want to there at russellgraves.com. There's nothing there for sale. So uh, you, uh, you you might want to spend some time, waste some time at, at work by looking through another website or send me an email at russell at russellgraves.com uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, just got a comment in from Mary saying she enjoyed the presentation. I appreciate that, Mary. Uh, I've got just to look into the future a little bit. I've got another uh, presentation coming up next week. I believe it may be the reschedule of the wildlife photography critique. And so if, uh, you know, we can definitely carry on that conversation then. I know I've got that presentation and I'm, I may have a little time off after that because uh, I'll be back out in the field. And then let me see, we got some, uh, oh, we got a bunch of more questions rolling in here. So let me get to these one by one. Uh, Zachary asked, do you tend to, to sh I'm guessing that's supposed to be shoot more of an animal and then crop. You know, really, Zachary, I, I honestly, I try not to crop that much. Uh, if you've been on one of my workshops before and I can show you the images as they came out of the camera, you'll see that they don't change much from, from what I, I see. I, I try to get, try to get the picture I'm going to take in the camera all the time. Doesn't always work out that way, but I really, really try hard to do that. Uh, and the reason is I'd rather be out taking pictures than I would be working on pictures in the computer. So, uh, yeah, I try to, I try to think about all those things we talked about, the composition, the, just the technical excellence of a photo, the lighting and all that, and just try to get it right one time so that way I don't have to fool with it after the fact. And so ultimately answer your question, no, not really. I just don't try to crop that much. Uh, Bernice asked if you want to sell wildlife photos, are there particular vendors better to use? And you might, you might uh, clarify that a little bit, Bernice. Are you, are you talking about selling prints or what? I mean, what, how are we talking about selling them? And I can answer your question a little better from there. Uh, Steve says, don't know if you mentioned it. Must you use Photoshop or Lightroom or can you get pictures right out of the camera for contest? It depends on the contest, Steve. Uh, some, some will allow you a little more leeway to do that kind of stuff, but a lot, a lot of them want to see what they look like right out of cameras. And so uh, it, it all depends on what the contest says. And then Daniel asks, thoughts on spending money on DSLR lenses versus waiting for the transition for mirrorless cameras and lenses? You know, that's a that's a good question, Daniel. And that's something I've been wrestling with myself. I don't currently, I've used mirrorless cameras, but I don't own any mirrorless cameras. Currently, I use DSLRs and I was showing my wife and this just yesterday, I was showing her online about how cameras that I bought three and four years ago for $3,500, $4,000. You can go buy them used now for, uh, uh, gosh, a thousand bucks, less than that in some cases. And so I think with this shift to mirrorless, at least for the short term, there's a lot of good deals to have on DSLR equipment. And the DSLR equipment, there's nothing wrong with it. And so I, you know, I'm giving you a long answer to the question, but one of the things, again, I'm struggling with is, uh, do I do I make the switch over to mirrorless all at one time and spend a lot of money? Do I kind of do it gradually over time, or do I just hold off on mirrorless altogether and just keep buying up all these used lenses and, and bodies that are still that still work good and are still plenty capable of doing the job I need them to do, and uh, and and just wait all together? So. I don't know. That kind of comes down to a personal decision, Daniel, on what you think is best for you. I think right now I'm leaning towards making a slow transition to mirrorless and then still buying some DSLR stuff over, over time. And then uh, Jeff says, do you have photo hacks? Oh, you have a photo hacks webinar next week. Can you explain more about that? Okay. Thanks, Jeff, for correcting me on that. Uh, yeah, the photo hacks webinar are just some real quick tips that I use when I go out and take pictures that uh, may help you make sure that you get the shots you're aiming for when you go in the field. I don't want to go too much into it, but I've got about 10 different things that I do that I try to practice almost all the time I go in the field and really helps improve your odds of getting those really great pictures. And let's see... 
Bernice, I'm going to come back to your question about selling photos. Uh, well, and then Diana had a similar question. I'll answer those at the same time. And then appreciate that, Leonard. He says he enjoyed the presentation, particularly loved the examples and in, in your talk about composition and techniques. I'm glad you like that. And then uh, Bernice says she's clarifying on hers. Scott asked the question, when shooting spot focus, do you do you often move your spot focus point off to one side or another to aid in composition or to any point that the situation requires? Usually, Scott, I'll move around that focusing point, and that's what I'll do. I'll use the one focusing point and then move it around depending on composition of where I need it to. Uh, the, the cameras I use are, I've, I've got one, well, this is one of the cameras I've got. This isn't the one I use the most for wildlife. But here's a Canon 90D, and on the back of these Canons, and I, it may be the way that, they got these little, like a joystick on the back. And so what I do is when I'm taking pictures, I can use my thumb to move that joystick, move the focus point around pretty quickly. And uh, and that's how I try to achieve focusing, achieve composition all at the same time without having to crop. And then I'll appreciate that comment, Daniel. Okay, so here's the big question. It's really asked by, Bernice, as well as uh, Diana. They So Diana asked the question, how and where do you find magazines to submit your images to? And the Bernice wants to know about selling pictures in general. Really, uh, you, there's a couple of ways to think about this. Selling pictures in general, it really would help you to define what it is you want to sell and how you want to sell it. Uh, cause that's a pretty broad question. The, you know, because the, the magazine business is different from the print business or, or, and they're both different from the commercial photography business where you're trying to get hired by companies to shoot pictures up for ad campaigns for those companies. And it's different than the photography education or workshop business. And so you've got all these different avenues and, and each way requires a different way of doing business. And so really Here's, an, here's a non-answer to an answer to a question, Bernice, is you really need to define kind of what your thing is going to be because at any particular day when I turn my computer on and I sit down in my office to do some work, uh, depending on what's at hand that day is, is how I'm reacting to it differently. And so since Diana asked the question about magazines, that's, that's a particular niche that I can be a little more specific about. And really, it's... it's at the, that point it's business 101 diana it's if you've got it something you want to sell the first thing you do, need to do is identify who your customers are going to be and so that comes with research uh one of the things i do the internet doesn't necessarily make it easier it 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 actually kind of makes you wade into the weeds a little deeper but one of the things i do a lot of times i've got i've got a stable of magazines i do pretty steady work for and they hire me a lot and I do a lot of pitch ideas to them and it's kind of back and forth. I do a lot of work for them, but understanding the business and understanding a magazine you may work for today, you may not be working for them tomorrow because the people you've been working with, they may go take another job somewhere else and they get someone new in and you're having to rebuild a relationship or the magazine gets gobbled up by another publication or the magazine gets shut down altogether. And so one of the things I'm constantly doing is understanding that there's a certain bit of attrition in the business I do like there is in any business. I mean, if you've got a restaurant in town and you're serving customers, you're going to have your core group of customers that are coming in all the time, but you're going to have a certain amount of attrition where people are going to move away. They're going to go eat somewhere else. They're going to leave and go and just go try out another restaurant. And so you do what you can to keep the core, but you're on the lookout for the new customers all the time and trying to market to them. And one of the things I do to find new markets is I'll go to Barnes and Noble. And, uh, you know, we've been hearing for 25 years now that the magazine business is dead. Well, no one told Barnes and Noble that because you walk into a Barnes and Noble store and I would argue there's more magazines now than there ever has been. Uh, I'm thinking of the last Barnes and Noble I went into, which was probably in Anchorage, Alaska, maybe. And they've got just walls and walls and walls of magazines. And so, from there, you know, they're all sectioned off based on the, you know, 
what the enthusiast group they're going after. And so once you find that niche you think you can do, uh, you got to figure out, okay, there, there's my possible customer. Well, who's the person that makes the decision within that magazine? And most of the time it's either a photo editor or an art director, and they're the ones that make decisions. And so from there, it's building relationships and building uh, trust with those guys where they'll give you, and I use guys collect, uh, collectively to mean both men and women, but building a relationship with those guys so that way you can at least have a chance to get in front of them and pitch what you do to see if there's a match somewhere along the way. And so Diana and, and uh, Bernice both, that's a real sort of generic way of looking at it. But again, it's when you talk about photography business, it's two separate things. There's photography is one, and then the business is a whole other separate thing. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I've told people this before that, that uh, have cared to listen. I've never really considered myself the best photographer in the world, but I think early on what I did figure out better than anybody else was the business of it. And so just being able to understand it from a business standpoint and understanding how to do those things that every business does from marketing to customer acquisition to customer retention to, you know, I spent this morning sending off invoices to being my own bookkeeper to doing all the things that a small business has to do to stay afloat. Uh, I, I'm not going to say I'm the best at that either. But I've at least found this intersection where my photography skills meet my business skills, where I've been able to make a, a nice living from it and uh, be able to bless my family from a financial standpoint, uh, maybe in a better, better way than I was ever uh, raised by my parents. And so uh, it's been a, it's been a blessing to be able to do it and and push a button on a mechanism that other people and then whatever you create, other people find value in. So uh that is my best advice is just trying to Diana and, and uh, Bernice is just trying to think about it like a business and then exploit it like you would any other particular business. And so I know we still got people in the audience cause they're still out there. I can see them uh, on my list. Oops. We had some more questions come in. I wasn't paying attention to. Oh, appreciate your comments, Daniel. Think thinks that. Okay. So Bernice clarified hers and said individual print sales purchased by random customers who want to search for a particular category of photos. So, you know, I think they're kind of what I said earlier. Uh, Bernice is just uh, so you got to find out who those customers are because you can't assume that everybody is in the mood to buy right now. And so you, everyone's in a different buying cycle. Some people are ready to buy now. Some people are ready to buy in six months. Some people may be ready to buy a year. Some people may, may never want to buy. And so I think that the, the challenge is, is figuring out who those people are from a demographic standpoint and trying to use the tools we have at our disposal, like social media marketing to uh, reach those people who may be potential customers. And I, I, and, and I know I'm being vague on that. Uh, but the, the, the truth is, I don't know what, exactly your your you know your kind of niche is you're trying to sell and it's just and so i've got to answer it in a little bit of vague like that if you want to if you want to follow off follow up uh more privately and send me an email later on i'll help you all i can on figuring that out uh appreciate your comment oh don and Edie is here so hi, hi guys uh they're the don and Edie. i'm gonna brag on them they're the best bet nicest couple i've ever met in texas couldn't couldn't answer two nicer people and uh I ran into them in in Alaska about a month ago and it was great to catch up with those guys we did a trip to Costa Rica a few years ago and uh if if the everybody else listen ever gets to meet Don and Edie your life will be better for it uh Bruce appreciate it Bruce all right just more thank yous all right I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it uh Cliff and Jan and, and Diana and everybody else who's been listening in. And then uh, Tracy says, thank you. I'd love to go on a trip with, with your group. Absolutely. Anytime, Tracy. Uh, you know, I'm just one of the guys that, that does this for backcountry journeys. We've got a lot of other good guys that do this. Uh, I'm just, I just try to go out and have fun all the time and, and try to uh, share what I know with people and, and share our love of photography and our love of nature together. And, I just love talking about taking pictures. So 
Anytime you get ready, we're ready. Uh, Steve asked the question, is your website made by you or do you use the company? Initially, Steve, I, I, I hired a developer to do my website for me. When I say initially, I've had a website for, oh gosh, probably 20, almost 25 years. I've had a website, uh, early on, I, I, early on, I made it myself. I learned how to make just rudimentary websites back in the old AOL days. And so the first version was that. And once I saw some traction in that website, the second version or the second iteration, like Russell Graves 2.com 2.0, is I hired a developer because at that point, probably in 2004, 2005, and I was so unsophisticated about what I want, the only way I knew to describe it was I told this guy, I want a way to, to have like a Google, but only that searches my website, nobody else's. I don't want, you know, if, if someone goes on there on my website and searches whitetail deer, they'll only see my pictures of whitetail deer. And so this guy, built me a site with a, my own searchable database. And so that's where I started extracting value in my photos. And so over time, uh, for the, probably the next 10 years, he kept, kept it updated for me. And I had a couple of different iterations on the way it looked. Well, now what I call Russell Graves 3.0, I use a template site. And because uh, it, they're just from a cost standpoint, it's a lot more cost effective. It doesn't really bother me that my website may look like somebody else's. The pictures are different, but the design's the same. But the truth is there's a little bit of, from the photo buyers we use, I've started finding out there's a little bit of familiarity with if it's, if your platform is virtually the same as a lot of other ones are using, it just makes, them e makes it easier for the people that are licensing pictures to search for stuff. And so right now, like I said, I use Photo Shelter. They've got a really robust back end where I can, uh, I can keep my images, even though you can, there's only, even though you can only see some galleries that are front facing to the, to everyone who looks, if you look in the upper right hand corner of my website, there's a little magnifying glass. And then there's, I probably have 40 or 45,000 images on the back end of that website that you can search by keyword. And that's, that's how the various photo buyers that use, utilize my website. That's how they find the images. Uh, and then Steve uses AOL for your, for your email, Steve, I don't, I mean this in the nicest sort of way with all the love in my heart, but you're kind of a dinosaur. Uh, when it comes to that, I don't see many AOL addresses anymore. And then Lee, uh, hope you're doing well. Lee, Lee is the man when it comes to Southern Florida. If you need to, if you need to know where to go, Lee is your guy. Uh, he says, is there going to be a replay of this webinar? Yes, there will be. Uh, I am not sure exactly when it will be. I know when I end it, it does all the back end work and it, it, uh, it, I'm not sure how quick you get it from the time I'm finished to when the replay is available for you guys to look at it, but I know it replay will be, uh, will be available. And Steve says having an AOL address makes them original. It certainly does. That's awesome. Oh, there's another one. Jan still has an AOL address. Well, guys, uh, well, okay, so now Lee's telling me he has an AOL account. So there must be a lot more out in the out in the world than I think they are. You guys ought to start a subgroup with just like a Facebook group, people with AOL accounts. Uh Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a look at that, Steve. I'm copying that address right now. Well, guys, I really appreciate it again. If you have any other questions or comments for me after it looks like the questions are kind of dying down, uh, feel free to send me an email. Always happy to answer and always uh, happy to, to share, you know, whatever knowledge I have with you guys. And hope to see you all soon on one of the Backcountry Journeys trips. I know we've got a busy fall coming up. I'm excited. I know the other guys in the group are excited. So. Uh, Talk to you soon. In the meantime, I uh, hope to see you here next week. Where again, as I was corrected, it'll be photo hacks to help improve your photography will be coming up next week. So thanks a lot, everyone. Talk to you soon.